A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. When people refer to the North Pole, they are usually talking about it as Santa Claus's home. It conjures up images of elves and toys and reindeer, but not murderers. But this podcast is about killers, and even the North Pole has been a crime scene. Well, the real city of North Pole, that is, the one in Alaska, not Santa's place. It's a small town just south of the Arctic Circle, with a population of around 2,500 people. With all the snow and cold there, it easily fits into the storybook version of its fictitious counterpart. The town has streets with names like Kris Kringle Drive and Mistletoe Lane. There's a huge store in the city called the Santa Claus House, and its walls are papered with children's letters to Santa. The town is covered with Christmas decorations year-round, including candy cane striped streetlights and a big Santa statue. But in 1979, this idyllic town was shocked when several young women and girls went missing. Investigators did not realize they had a serial killer on their hands until the body started appearing the following year. The women had all been murdered in the same horrific fashion, and most of the bodies were left within a 10-mile radius of each other. But it wasn't until after the murderer left Alaska that police began to put the pieces together and realized their main suspect was not who they originally thought. And although the killer eventually confessed to the crimes, the police were powerless to arrest him. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. Through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse, I've spent five decades studying people's minds. I've interviewed many murderers, including serial killers. And the question I get asked time and time again is, why did they do it? I want to give you a satisfying answer to that question. So in this series, I'm diving deep into the mindsets of these criminals to give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is Thomas Richard Bunday, the North Pole Killer. Alaska is known for its spectacular natural beauty, but it can also be treacherous terrain. Wilderness expert Dan Oberlotz once described Alaska like this. There are many things that can kill you in Alaska. The weather can kill you. The wildlife is dangerous and has killed many people. You always have to have a heightened sense of awareness in Alaska. You have to be in tune with everything around you. While this is certainly true, he left one thing off the list, or rather one person, Thomas Richard Bunday. Back in 1979, Bunday was serving as an airman at the Eielson Air Force Base in Fairbanks, Alaska. On August 29th of that year, Glenda Soderman, a 19-year-old newlywed who recently had a baby, went missing. Her father, a state trooper, insisted that Glinda wouldn't just run away. And tragically, he was right. About a month later, on October 1st, Glinda's decomposed body was found in a gravel pit. She had to be identified through dental records. Glinda had been strangled and then shot through the head with a 357 Magnum pistol. She was found fully clothed and there was no evidence of a sexual assault. This was the beginning of a harrowing two and a half years of disappearances and murders of young women around Fairbanks. Nine months later, on June 13, 1980, 
11-year-old Doris Oring was abducted while riding her bike. Over 200 people formed a search party that scoured the area where she was last seen. They found nothing at the time, and the police never suspected that these two incidents were connected. It wasn't until the third disappearance on January 31, 1981, that police began to suspect these events might all be connected. The next two disappearances occurred much closer together. One victim was last seen on March 5th, and the next on May 16th. All three women's bodies were later found in the same area as Glinda. They too had been strangled and shot in the head. Doris's brother had seen her talking with a strange man just two days before her disappearance. He described the man as being in military garb, having a mustache, and driving a blue car. The police had a sketch of the man made from his description and got to work getting the word out. After the fourth body was discovered, a joint task force was formed that included the OSI, Office of Special Investigations, from Eielson Air Force Base and the Criminal Investigative Division from another neighboring Army base. The Fairbanks City and North Pole Police Departments were also called in, and since one body was found on federal land, the FBI became involved as well. The killings stopped in May of 1981, so the task force concluded at the time that the murderer was either incarcerated, had moved out of the area, or was dead. So they gathered a list of all of the military personnel who transferred around that time off of the Eielson base. Then the police department got its first computer and used it to sort through all the transfers. They took that information and compared it to lists they had compiled of people with blue cars or white trucks, because those were also seen in the vicinity of where the women had disappeared. They also spread the word to the lower 48 states to be on the lookout for murders that fit similar patterns to those in Alaska. In November, the task force received an alert that a body had been found in Wichita Falls, Texas. Like the Alaskan women, this woman was found fully clothed, strangled, and shot in the head. When they cross-referenced the list from the Air Force, they found one man who had transferred to Wichita Falls. He had a blue car and a white truck. And he had problems with his female co-workers. His name? Thomas Richard Bunday. The investigators took pictures of Bunday and his cars to Doris's brother, and when he positively identified both Bunday and his car, the investigators knew they had their man. So who was Thomas Richard Bunday? Here's what we know. Thomas Richard Bunday, or Richard, as he was more commonly known, was born in Nashville, Tennessee on September 28, 1948. He was the younger of two sons, raised in a very troubled home. By the time he was born, his parents had already been divorced and remarried to each other twice. They divorced for a third time when he was seven. The home was plagued by violence. Richard's father, a welder turned salesman, suffered from unspecified mental disorders and would often beat Richard and his mother. School was not much easier for Richard. He did well academically, but he was not popular and struggled with his weight. Growing up, Richard was five foot nine and weighed 300 pounds. Obesity among kids at that time was very rare. So this made Richard stand out and probably a target for bullies. According to a 2014 article by Michael Hink, quote, many studies have shown that obese teens 
have significantly lower self-esteem than their non-obese peers. The disparity in self-confidence is most prevalent around age 14, which also happens to be a critical time for teens because it is when they develop their sense of self-worth. Young teens around this age are also more often subjected to teasing, taunting, and poor treatment. And this can result in depression or anger issues. When Richard was around 15 years old, his father died. The day before, he had beaten Richard badly. So instead of going to his father's funeral, Richard went to a band contest that day. We've spoken in other episodes about the negative effects that abuse and trauma can have on a developing mind. Dr. Bruce Perry, a child psychiatrist and child trauma expert at Northwestern University, wrote that children reflect the world in which they are raised. If that world is characterized by threat, chaos, fear, and trauma, the brain will reflect that by altering the development of the neurosystems involved in the stress and fear response. In other words, ongoing stress and repeated trauma can affect the proper development of a healthy brain. This is certainly true for Richard Bunday. His friends described him as unpredictable and his pranks tended to be sadistic. He liked to sneak up on people and pinch them so hard that they would bruise. A childhood friend talked about a time that Richard became angry at a neighbor he thought had hurt one of his pets. He sought revenge by putting cherry bomb firecrackers in baby food jars, lighting them and throwing them at his neighbor's livestock. The jars exploded, sending pieces of glass-like shrapnel that hit all the animals. And considering the ongoing physical abuse and violence Richard suffered as a teen at the hands of his own father, it's easy to see how he developed into a killer. In the spring of 1966, he married his high school girlfriend and joined the Air Force shortly after. He was serving in Southeast Asia when he began having an affair with another woman. When his wife found out, she decided to have her own affair and became pregnant with her lover's child. She gave birth to a boy. Despite the drama, Richard and his wife reconciled and went on to have one daughter together, and reportedly, the daughter was treated kindly by Richard, while his wife's lover's son was not. Richard moved up the Air Force ranks, eventually becoming not only a technical sergeant, but also an instructor for Air Force recruits. His female co-workers, however, were not so fond of him. There were complaints to his supervisors in the Air Force that he was hostile and would make inappropriate sexual remarks to women on the base. This hostility was not limited to his co-workers. According to friends and neighbors, while camping, he would always make his wife carry the heavy sacks, and if she would stumble or fall or even complain, he would beat her and kick her in front of other people. I'm sure that a lot of his anger and venom came from watching how his father treated his mother, or perhaps I should say mistreated her. His father was reportedly very misogynistic and would degrade Richard's mother constantly. The dictionary defines misogyny as the hatred, dislike, or inherent mistrust of women. There is research indicating that a boy's early maternal relationships may shape their attitudes later in life toward other women. When children are abused, they often blame the non-parental abuser for not stepping in and protecting them. And anger builds up, and it usually manifests itself in bad behavior towards others that resemble the non-abuser. As a child, it must have been confusing for Richard that his mother did not stop his father from abusing him. In fact, 
she divorced him and then went back to him when Richard was seven. And I think it's important to note that Richard was already being abused at that time. According to newspaper articles, his brother, who was 15 years older than Richard, was the family member who took care of him after his father died, not his mother. His brother said that their family was not an emotional one. They were conditioned to never show emotion. Richard's friends said that he was full of repressed rage. His wife told reporters that she was constantly, and I quote, trying to keep him calm down. That's what I was trying to do all along. He was easily agitated. He blew up all over. In the time between Richard's first and second murder, he went to see a psychologist on base, Captain Clarence Williams. His wife said he sought out counseling due to marital issues, but Williams remembered that they spoke much more about his issues with his father. Williams said that Richard, quote, had a lot of unresolved problems concerning his father. There were feelings that his father died before he could prove he was somebody. There was a lot of love-hate. We've spoken a lot on Killer Psyche about how abused children still want to impress their abuser. Pedro Rodriguez Filio killed for his father's honor even though his father had brutally beaten him and his mother constantly. This seems to be true of Richard and his father as well. However, seeing this particular psychologist, Captain Williams, proved not to be the best solution for Richard because seven months after their sessions, his psychologist was arrested for hiring a hitman to shoot his own wife in the face with a shotgun. Interestingly enough, Richard switched to using a shotgun after his second murder. If this was the advice that Richard was receiving from him, I get why his therapy did not work. In later articles written about Richard, his wife expressed that she thought he had a split personality, one that was kind that she saw, and another that was this man that the police were describing as a killer. What people used to call a split personality or multiple personality disorder is now termed dissociative identity disorder, or DID for short. There are lots of common depictions of this in classic films like The Three Faces of Eve and Sybil, and more recently, the horror thriller Split. But most people do not have an accurate understanding of DID. According to the Cleveland Clinic, people with this disorder have two or more identities whose personalities control their behavior at different times. Each identity has its own personal history, traits, likes, and dislikes. DID can lead to gaps in memory and hallucinations, believing something is real when it is not. DID is usually caused by sexual or physical abuse in a person's childhood, or it can develop after a traumatic event such as combat during a war or a natural disaster. It can even be caused by a child witnessing something horrible or traumatic such as a murder, or even an accidental death. The theory behind it is that when a person dissociates from their primary personality, the purpose is to protect the primary personality. It's a way of detaching themselves from whatever the trauma is. In my 10 years in maximum security psychiatry, I saw a number of adults with this problem. And in most of the cases, it related back to sexual abuse by an adult when they were very young. I once had a patient who told me that whenever she was being sexually abused as a child, she would float up to the top of the room and she could see what was happening to her as she was looking down, but she felt nothing. No pain, no anxiety, no fear. 
It was as if she described her spirit left her body. It dissociated. It divided from her body to save her from the pain. I have heard people throw around terms like split personality and multiple personality disorder to describe a person who reacts to situations in unexpected ways or who behave in a way that is contrary to their general demeanor. This is not DID, and Richard definitely did not have that diagnosis. Like most serial killers, he simply had a secret life, and his family and friends didn't know about it. The only people to see his murderous side were his victims. That diagnosis, however, is a common insanity defense strategy for serial killers when they get caught. Hey, I didn't do it. The bad guy living in my body did it. And juries are usually happy to convict the killer on the inside as well as the killer on the outside. Once they realized they had a serial killer on the loose, the investigators sought the help of the FBI to create a profile of their killer, hoping it would give them a direction of where to take the investigation. Profiling was very new at that time. It had just been very helpful in the capture of the Atlanta child murderer, and the detectives in Alaska were eager to make use of it. Unfortunately, the profile for the Alaska case was way off the mark on many key characteristics. According to the profile, the killer would be a male over 35, either single or divorced, a civilian who had trouble holding on to a job and that he'd be a heavy drinker. Bunday was 34, married with two children, in the military with a solid job, and he was not a drinker at all. At the time, Quantico experts had a success rate of 85%. What I mean by that is when the killer was actually apprehended and his characteristics were compared to the profile, they were turning out to be 85% accurate. But only 60% of the Alaska murder profile actually fit the real killer. So let's talk about profiling. Criminal profiling is a combination of art and science. People who really understand it are artists. Many different things go into the creation of a profile of an unknown offender. It is critically important, in my opinion, that the person developing the profile has a lot of life experience. I'm frequently asked by young people in college or about to go to college, what does it take to be a profiler? And I can tell you, in my opinion, the most important thing is maturity and experience with life. A 25-year-old, maybe even 30-year-old, is unlikely to have enough life experience to develop an accurate profile. A lot of things go into the profile, and life experience is just one of them, but it's a very important one. It's important to recall that FBI criminal profiling started to be developed in the late 70s, early 80s. This case happened in 1981. The profilers didn't have the breadth of information on serial killers that they do now. One thing that is significant to examine when creating a profile is the method of killing. In this case, Bundy would strangle the women with his hands and then shoot them in the face. However, he did not shoot the youngest victim, Doris, but we'll get into that in a second. He told investigators that he shot the women only to make sure that they were dead. But I have a different interpretation of that. He was shooting the women in the face with a shotgun that totally obliterates a person's face and probably skull. Why was he doing that? It seemed important to him. Well, what is our face? Our face is our essence. It's our personality. Our face is important to our identity. 
And Richard Bunday was obliterating his victims by shooting them in the face with a shotgun. If I had any doubt that Richard Bunday hated women to the core, that doubt is removed by knowing what he did to their face. According to a 2018 study done by the Finnish National Bureau of Investigation, homicidal strangulation accounts for approximately 10 to 20 percent of all homicidal deaths in various countries. Casey Gwynn and Gail Strack, the co-founders of the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, have been stating for nearly 10 years that men who strangle women are the most dangerous men on the planet. Using your hands or other body parts to strangle someone is called manual strangulation. And to strangle the life out of someone, especially using just your hands, is to exert absolute control over them. You are literally holding their life in your hands. Killers that use this method do it for a reason. The primary motivation of serial killers is to dominate and control their victims. With strangulation, the domination and control of the moment is very satisfying to the killer and appeals to their sadistic side as well. We have heard that Richard was sadistic at a young age from his friends, and this was taking his sadism one step further. While he was murdering his victims, he was looking into their eyes, probably enjoying their fear. There were no reports, and there is no evidence, that he had sex with any of his victims. Choking the life out of defenseless victims is what gave him pleasure. For Richard to have that kind of control over someone was the opposite of his childhood. He felt powerful in that moment. He was no longer the suffering, helpless child that he had been with his father. He was a different person, and he was different physically, too. He had shed the 300-pound child and was now a lean, 170-pound man. If serial killers tend to have a similar pattern in how they choose and kill their victims, why did Bundy treat the murder of 11-year-old Doris differently than his other victims? Not only did he hide her body, but he did not shoot her in the face. I think he may very well have had some misgivings about killing a child, but more likely, the community he lived in would be horrified that an 11-year-old girl was murdered, and he did not want to face the music if he was caught. Richard also had cameras on the sites where he left his victim's body, and he could access them from where he worked. He would watch the locations of the murders, knowing his victims were there, and relive his crimes over and over. He kept other, more tangible mementos from his crimes as well. His wife told investigators that when they were moving, she found pictures of women at the house. Some of them were clothed and some of them were not. Her husband told her that they were women he was trying to help. So she threw away the pictures and let it go. That will leave a lot of you speechless. But unfortunately, I've heard it before. His wife was compliant. She was a pushover. She believed anything he told her, possibly because she didn't have any choice. It has been my experience that most women who are married to brutal men, men that are killers, even though they may not know about the killing, they know their husband's a brute and they don't want to deal with any problems, so they are compliant. When the Alaskan investigators found out about the murder in Texas, they immediately flew down to see if it was the work of their killer. They were stymied by Texas law enforcement. It made no sense to the Alaskan detectives, but the sheriff in Texas insisted that they already had their man, so the detectives would get no help from him. 
The investigators went to visit Richard at his house and requested that he take a lie detector test. Although he was friendly to them, Richard refused to take the test and also refused to let them search his house and cars. Without a warrant, the Alaskan police were out of luck. So the troopers went back to Alaska and continued to work the case, now armed with photos of Bundy and his vehicles. After receiving verbal confirmations from eyewitnesses that had seen either Richard or his cars near where the victims were last spotted, they were certain that Richard was their killer. A few months later, two of the investigators went back to Texas. They camped out at a local motel and staged one of their rooms to look as though they'd been watching Richard for a long time. They gave him a call and asked him to stop by for a chat. Richard came to see them several days in a row, arriving early to each meeting. He would stay several hours and talk to the two men about everything but murder. The troopers were baffled by his behavior. He would not deny the murders, but he would not confess either. Richard was very C3. And if you've been listening to other episodes of Killer Psyche, you know that means cool, calm, and collected. This is the behavior of a psychopath when they are trying to manipulate someone. So here we are at the familiar. Was he a psychopath or a sociopath? I believe he exhibited signs of both. Certainly, early childhood abuse points to sociopath, but his father struggled with mental issues too. And Richard clicks on the majority of psychopathic traits. The bottom line is, for both psychopath and sociopath, they have a profound disregard for the rights of others. And he fits that bill to a T. I want to kill you, and I'm going to do it. The troopers would record each conversation, but they were recorded with a tape recorder that cut off after three hours. After a week of these meetings, Bundy showed up at their hotel, but he wouldn't come in and he wouldn't speak. Instead, he handed them a piece of paper and left. It was a note that told the investigators that he had enjoyed getting to know them, but he didn't do what they were accusing him of doing. This was the first time in a week that he had denied the murders. Knowing that their daily chats were over, the investigators obtained a search warrant and spent 12 hours combing through Richard's home and vehicles. And Richard stayed by their side through the entire search. I've executed many search warrants, and the individual usually sits on the sofa, kind of nervous, or gets in their car and goes for coffee and doesn't come back. I never had anybody stand right next to me or fellow agents while we were searching. The troopers gathered bags of evidence, including ammunition that was similar to the ones used in the crimes and newspaper articles about the murders. When they questioned him about a newspaper clipping that described the incorrect profile of the murderer, Richard laughed and said that it was just a souvenir to remind him of Fairbanks. The troopers knew they had their man, but they had to wait for an arrest warrant to come from Alaska. A few hours after they finished at Richard's house, they get a call from him saying that they might have accidentally taken his car keys. Richard tells them that he will come to speak with them at nine the next morning. Sensing that Richard still wanted to talk, the trooper kept him on the phone. The officer pressed him about the five murders in Alaska and told him that the crimes were not going to go away. Before Richard hung up, the trooper attempted to trip him up by accusing him of six murders, one that he knew Richard did not commit. 
He wanted him to deny it and admit to the others. That plan worked the next morning when Richard arrived an hour early to see them. Remember, he said they might have his keys. Eventually, he comes clean about the murders when the detective brings up the youngest victim, Doris, asking him to let them know where her body is so that her family can finally have peace. Bundy broke down in tears and confessed to everything. When they asked him why he killed, he said that he didn't know that he was having problems with women while he was in Alaska. Bundy agreed to go back with them to Alaska, but the troopers did not yet have the warrant, and they were scared that he might change his mind and leave them at one of the layovers to Alaska. So, the governor of Alaska sent them a private jet to bring them back the next day. However, the next morning, Richard did not show up. It was the first time he had missed an appointment with them. The troopers contacted the surveillance team at Richard's home only to find out that he had escaped their watch on a motorcycle. A few hours later, they received a shocking phone call. Thomas Richard Bunday was dead. After Richard left his house, he dropped off his taxes and went to an overpass where he left the trooper's cards on a rock. He then drove his motorcycle a hundred miles an hour down a road, crossed his motorcycle over the center line, and slammed into an oncoming truck. He died instantly. The truck driver said that he tried to avoid him. He even went off the road, but Richard kept following him until he crashed. They say the only thing you can truly count on in life is death and taxes. For Richard, they just happened to come on the same day. Months later, the investigators got definitive proof that Richard Bunday was the right man. Hairs collected from his truck belonged to one of the victims, and the ammunition matched bullets found at two of the crime scenes. And finally, in 1986, six years after her disappearance and nearly three years after her murderer's death, police found Doris Oring. Doris would have graduated high school the same year that her remains were found. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll be doing an update on the Gabby Petito case. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Anne Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager and Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Treefort.